and then we'll get on with the show. So, did you guys finish with the book? Yes. Yeah. Yes. We've got the big twist at the end. We get the big reveal of the ultimate villain in the story. Uh, but before that, well, let's just dive right in. 14 to 17, the final chapters. 17, not even really a chapter. <laughs> a few paragraphs, pretty much. Um, aha, there's Vasilye. Hello, Vasilye. Hello. Uh, all right. So we're all set then. Our first blurb for today. Takes more than a bag to seal in food flavor. It takes Ubic plastic wrap, actually four layers in one. Keeps freshness in, air and moisture out. Watch this simulated test. Interesting. No warning this time. Uh, for whatever reason. Overview of this chapter. Uh, so if you recall, this is when Joe has been revived, and now he and Runciter will have a little chat. Runciter gives him the breakdown, although there seems to even be some conflicting, some conflict at Runciter's claims, even in this scene. Um, so he claims that uh, everyone died in the explosion except for Runciter, uh, and that they are in half life. Uh, Joe responds to this information by accusing Runciter of not really knowing what's going on <laughs> or what Ubik is or anything. Uh, Joe is correctly suspicious through that conversation. Uh, Runciter concedes that he does not know what's going on. Uh, Joe figures there must be one entity trying to help him and another trying to destroy him. Uh, Runciter wants to call Ella, but fears that Jory might take over the call again. And he ponders, maybe there's never been anyone in Half-Life like, Half -Life like Jory before. Uh, so let's get into it. Uh, over a cigarette, they discuss the situation. Joe asks if he can Ubik the rest of the group. He says, I have exactly one can of Ubik. Uh, most of it I've had to use on you. Uh, he says, my ability to alter things here is limited. I've done what I could. Uh, so there's just a bit of Ubik left in the, in the spray can, apparently. Uh, he asks him about the graffiti and the television commercial. He says, you wrote that we're dead and you're alive. He says, I am alive. Are we dead? And he says, yes, after pausing. And this is, again, where things get a little bit iffy but the taped TV commercial. So here he says, yeah, that was to get you to fight. So remember, there was this, is it live or is it taped uh, bit about that commercial? Because the commercial seemed to respond to him directly. And the idea that it was taped was framed in such a way as to say that uh, Sorry, my, my daughter's here. <laughs> here, you want to say hi? Okay, let's say hi. Hey. Hi. 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 Hello. Hi. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hello. 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 Hi. Hello. Is she two? Is she what? Is she two years old? Yep. Two years old. <laughs> okay. What's her name? What's her name? Sorry. Eris. Eris. Yeah. Okay, That's sweetheart. Good. Go ahead and run run along. Here. <laughs> All right, pumpkin. So yeah, this there was this discussion about whether the commercial was live or not. Oh yeah, and the, so it was framed in such a way as to suggest that Runciter had used a telepath, a precog, and that's why it seemed live, but it was actually taped. So here he seems to be implying that it or agree, at least going along with the idea that the commercial was taped. Um, even though, if you recall, it seems to be responding to his questions directly until he it's asks. Not. Yeah, exactly. It seems to just drift off and go back into 
a sort of just commercial droning. Um, so he says, yeah, that was to get you to fight, to find Ubik. It made you look and kept you, uh, and you kept on looking too. I kept trying to get it to you, but you know what went wrong? She kept drawing everyone into the past. So Runciter is still convinced at this point that it's Pat that's doing this and using her powers uh, to cause these regressions. Um, Joe is correctly suspicious here. Why would they go through all this trouble of just kind of tormenting us? Why not just blow us up? What's all this extra razzle dazzle? Why is that necessary is basically what he's asking here. Wouldn't the bomb be enough to get rid of us, to get rid of Runster and Associates? Uh, why use Pat? Uh, he sensed even in his weary shaken state something wrong. There's no reason for all this reversion machinery. This sinking us into a retrograde time momentum back here to 1939, it serves no purpose. Interesting point, says Runciter. He says, I'll have to think about it. Um, it strikes me, Joe said, that we appear to be faced, <laughs> what we appear to be faced with is a malignant rather than a purposeful force. Um, not so much someone trying to kill us or nullify us, someone trying to or someone trying to eliminate us from functioning as an organization, but rather an irresponsible entity that's enjoying what it's doing to us, the way it's killing us off one by one. So he senses this malice in what's happening. We're being toyed with. Why all of this? Um this has also been kind of getting at me uh we talked a bit about how we don't really understand how Runciter is interacting with this world so much and it's definitely a mystery um what i've just said isn't strictly true i don't hold the same relationship to the regressed world that the rest of you do you're absolutely right. I know too much. It's because I enter it from the outside. Manifestations. Yes, thrust down into this world here and there. So he's speaking as if he is placed in the world, right? He says, this world. I mean, do we imagine him talking on his headset sort of thing, saying this, using the phrase, this world? <clears throat> Yes, thrust down into this world here and there uh, at strategic points and times, like the traffic citation, like Archer's, you didn't tape that commercial, that was live, then runs it or not. So he's like lying even during this conversation. So with Ella, even though he visited a lot of times, he never could figure out what this half-life was like, but maybe it's because so many of them died at once and they were all people he knew maybe that's why he's gained more powers to go in more i don't know yeah or it's somehow ella doing it i mean maybe she's just a mouthpiece for him i don't know uh, it doesn't really get hashed out completely so it's kind of up to us to decide um, and there are theories we can talk about as we go forward. But yeah, like he even says here, yeah, I, I was lying. <laughs> that was a live commercial. Uh, <clears throat> Joe says, what about Pat Conley? Uh, yeah, she's in Half-Life 2. So they're all interwired, apparently. They're put together in a large group so that they're sharing their Half-Life experience. Are the regressions due to her talent? or the normal decay of half-life. So here we find out that it's apparently the case that this kind of regression is a normal experience for people in half-life, which didn't come up before in the book. Uh, he says, everyone who enters half-life experiences these regressions. Uh, you're lying to me, he says. What is Ubik, Joe said. No answer from, from Runciter. You don't know that either. You don't know what it is or why it works. Sweetie, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Uh, you don't even know where it comes from. 
And uh, yeah, this is the case. This is true. He doesn't. Uh, this is cold pack, Joe said. But there's something more, something not natural to people in Half-Life. It's funny to think <laughs> natural to people in Half-Life, which is this totally unnatural process <laughs> that people are subjected to <clears throat> if they can afford it. Uh, there are two forces at work, as Al figured out, one helping us, one destroying us. You're working with the force trying to help us. Uh, you got the Ubik from them. Well, now, wait a minute. Maybe they don't need to afford it. Maybe everybody goes to Half-Life and only if you have money, you can contact them. <laughs> but it's implied that there are maintenance. It oh, costs. yeah, that's, that's true. I mean, it's like running a server for someone, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It's like some multiplayer online game, but there's there are characters in there that belong to no one. <laughs> Just wandering around. Um, yeah, the economic and political questions behind all of this are really wild, um, but they're not delved into in any detail. Um, so none of us know even yet who it is that's destroying us and who's protecting us. You outside don't know and we in here don't know. Maybe it's Pat. I think it is. I think there's your enemy. Joe says, almost, but I don't think so. I don't think we've met our enemy face to face or our friend either. This turns out to be correct. So in trying to suss out the true culprit, Joe considers Sammy Mundo. There's a little detective scene where he's kind of going through all the possibilities. So what's our deal really? And it turns out that <clears throat> Sammy Mundo survived with massive brain injuries. So he says, maybe it's him somehow doing this. Where is he? Uh, he, uh, We sat down here in Zurich. He's at Carl Jung Hospital, <laughs> uh, about a quarter mile from this moratorium. Rent a telepath, have him scanned. Uh, because isn't Sammy Mundo mentioned as being kind of childish in his attitude or something when we first meet him at the beginning of the book? Uh, or at least young, disorganized and immature, cruel, unformed, peculiar personality. But Runciter has already done this, so they're ahead of the curve. I also wanted to just put this down because it's the Carl Jung Hospital, which is pretty funny that they would name a hospital after Carl Jung <coughs> in this reality. Yes, Vasily. Well, uh, Joe now being in Half-Life, He's uh, talking like he's uh, wise. He tells for someone that is disorganized and immature. But when he left, he didn't pay the for uh, uh, door to to open, and uh, he was actually immature. Right. Yeah, he has wild fluctuations in his personality. <clears throat> he every now and then comes out with clear thoughts he'll suddenly start pondering <laughs> something and he'll get a bit profound so sometimes he's clear and profound other times he's just kind of drifting around here we go here's the description of okay sammy mundo a weak nosed young man dressed in a maxi skirt with an undersized melon like head stuck his hand up in a spasmodic wobbling tick like gesture as if Joe thought the anemic body had done it himself. He knew this particular person. Mundo looked years younger than his chronological age. Both mental and physical growth process had ceased for him long ago. Technically, Mundo had the intelligence of a raccoon. He could walk, <laughs> eat, bathe himself even after a fashion talk. His anti-telepathic ability, however, was considerable. Once alone, he had blanked out S. Dull. Melopone, the firm's house magazine had rambled on about it for months afterwards. So he's incredibly strong as an anti telepath. Right. And he's mm -hmm. mentally undeveloped in some way. So we were talking about him as kind of an idiot savant or something. He's mm -hmm. super good at that at one ability that he has. Um, so that's why he considers him a possible. I mean, with those brain injuries, maybe it's just another Tuesday for him. <laughs> 
<laughs> and they're just checking all the possibilities. Um, but yes, uh, Rensiter has already had him scanned, and it turns out not to be the case. <laughs> There's a scene where he speaks with the lawyer. They talk about how it looks like an open and shut case against Hollis and Associates. Um, both the civil and criminal case looks really strong, supposedly. So apparently, if that is a real world, <laughs> there must be some evidence that's causing the lawyer to say this. Um, so Glenn decides he's going to rest, but then he changes his mind and says, you know what, I'm going to talk to Ella. Um, and that scene... Oh, yeah, there's a bit more. He wonders, am I going to get that damn jewelry this time? Or will I be able to keep Ella in focus long enough to tell her what Joe said? It's become so hard to hang on to her now with jewelry growing and expanding and feeding on her. Hmm. Sorry, something just occurred to me. So he actually does know about jewelry at this point. <laughs> he knows about the... I didn't think about this, but it says feeding on her. <clears throat> I mean, I know he knows Jory exists, but I didn't realize he knew the feeding part. So that slipped by me. That kind of makes me reevaluate some things. Go ahead. I'm sorry. And uh, uh, I think also he admitted uh, that he's also in uh, cold pack because he said uh, we were put uh, into cold pack by uh, solicitous uh, Stanton Meek, but not no contact could be established. They didn't get us soon enough. So he admitted that uh, he's with uh, all of them in. Uh... See, I, I read, I, I know what you're talking about. I read that as like our team, but yeah, I suppose it's possible that they're all in cold pack. That, Again, that I, I I don't like that as a way out because it seems too simple. Like it's it's like that. Oh, everyone's dreaming, ending that is kind of disappointing. I, yeah, I agree, but there are implications in the coinage. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. That he's in a half life later yeah, on. Yeah, that's that's definitely true, and we are going to talk about that. Um, <clears throat> I don't know. I think that's just my brain wants to find another way to make that <laughs> possible <laughs> but that's what's fun about this you know like think of another way that it could be um <clears throat> maybe only he's in half-life and all of this is just him kind of experiencing something through the others his idea of the others i don't know but we can talk about that later though maybe um, we are all in half-life that's right Maybe we're we've been dead the whole time. <laughs> um. So yeah, expanding it. Well, you know, he's been apparently talking to Ella more, but having a hard time keeping her in focus. So now I'm thinking, yeah, okay, Ella's filled him in on Jory. Um. The moratorium should do something about him. Jory's a hazard to everyone here. Why do they let him go on? Maybe they can't stop him. Maybe there's never been anyone like Jory in Half-Life before. Okay, so that's the end of that chapter. That scene gets picked up directly, not in this chapter, but the one after. <clears throat> um, our next blurb. Could it be that I have bad breath, Tom? Well, Ed, if you're worried about that, try today's new Ubik with powerful germicidal foaming action. Guaranteed safe when taken as directed. It's funny, that just conjures an image of someone <laughs> looking like they have rabies. <laughs> Foaming action. So the overview here, uh, Dom arrives, tells Joe the others are dying or dead, including Pat. Uh, Joe urges Don to try the Ubik spray. The spray reveals Don to be Jory, the true adversary. Uh, Jory describes how he consumes half-lifers so his energy levels will remain high. He claims to have created the entire world around Joe, but cannot stop things from regressing to earlier times. Joe tries to kill Jory, but Jory escapes. Okay, so let's get into it. This is interesting, too, because, um, well, well, I don't want to jump ahead. 
Um, the door to the hotel room opens. Don comes in. Uh, he says, how are you doing, Joe? Why aren't you lying down? For Christ's sake, get into bed. Joe explains the situation to Don based on the account of Runciter. So basically that we're dead. We're in half-life. That's what's happening. Uh, with regard to Runciter, Joe says, he was sitting across from me two, three minutes ago. Uh, Don says, no, he couldn't see him. Uh, that was the last thing he said to me, and then he cut contact, stopped communicating. Uh, just canceled himself out. Look on the vanity table and see if you uh, see if he left the spray can. So Danny searches and holds up the the can. Here it is, but it seems empty. He shakes it, almost empty. Spray what's left on yourself. Go ahead. At first, Don is hesitant. He kind of changes the subject. The others are dying. Joe. All of them. Everyone that's left. He held the can, but did not use it. Pat, too. When I got out of the elevator on the second floor here, I found her. It had just begun to hit her. She seemed terribly surprised. Apparently, she couldn't believe it. So I get the impression here that Pat believed that she was doing all this, that it had something to do with her power. Even Pat doesn't understand the nature of her abilities. Um, <clears throat> he sets the can down. I guess she thought she was doing it with her talent. That's right. That's what she thought. Why don't you use the Ubik, Don? Use it, or I'll use it on you. So Don picks up the can, shakes it, points it at himself. All right, fine, if that's what you want. I guess there's no reason not to. This is the end. I mean, they're all dead. Only you and I are left. And the Ubik is going to wear off you in a few hours, and you won't be able to get any more, which will leave me. Uh, so he sprays himself. After the cloud clears, the person standing there uh, in the center of the vaporizing stain of Ubik that had saturated the carpet was not Don Denny. It was someone else. <laughs> An adolescent boy, mawkishly slender, with irregular black button eyes beneath uh, tangled brows. He wore an anachronistic costume. Sorry, just one sec. White, drip-dry shirt jeans and laceless leather slippers um this seems to be the most <laughs> normal <laughs> quote unquote that we've seen anybody <laughs> uh it just sounds like yeah kind of regular clothes from the middle century um who are you says joe the boy's fingers writhe a twitch protecting uh, protecting him evidently from a stammer. Sometimes I call myself Matt, sometimes Bill. So those are the twins that people were seeing uh, at the beginning of the book, right? Do we recall that? Yes, they are all dreaming the same dream. Right. I'm sorry for interrupting you. Yeah. No, that's right. They were having the same dream. Um, and he reveals himself to be the twins from the dream. Uh, so that means they he is alive. sorry they were alive when they uh, had they dr this dream that's right they were telepaths and well inertials actually inertials so yeah that means Jory is able to reach out to some people <laughs> in in the world outside of Half-Life so that is something uh, to consider Mostly I'm Jory. That's my real name, Jory. Gray, shabby teeth showed as he spoke and a grubby tongue. <laughs> After an interval, he said, Joe said, where's Denny? He never came in this room, did he? Dead, he thought with the others. I ate Denny a long time ago. So there is this eating. What do you mean ate? Literally, he, he wondered, his flesh, flesh undulating with aversion. It's funny to think of him knowing that he's in a half-life and then saying literally <laughs> because what would literally even mean in this context i don't think people are consuming physical food in any way um no no one's gotten to eat the whole time was something that i noticed that reminded me of the discreet charm of the bourgeoisie that 
it's like mm-hmm. in a dream you never actually get to eat anything <laughs> right there is the restaurant though that comes up later the matador and it's funny because uh you could think of the matador uh <laughs> and the charging bull and the bull never hits the matador in the same way that nobody ever eats. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, the gross physical motion rolled through him engulfing him as if his body wanted to shrink away. However, he managed more or less to conceal it. I did what I do. It's hard to explain, but I've been doing it for a long time uh, to lots of half-life people. I eat their life. What remains of it? There is very little in each person, so I need a lot of them. Uh, He also says that he used to wait until they were weak. Um, I kind of left that part out. So he would, you know, wait until they'd had a number of visits, and then he would catch them when they were not so powerful. But apparently he's much more confident and much stronger. Now he goes after people, even in the plural. (laughs) He rotates the can of Ubik. I can't figure this out. What's in it? Where does Runsitter get it? Uh, Runsitter can't be doing it. You're right. He's on the outside. This originates from within our environment. It has to, because nothing can come in from outside except words. So this is pretty important. Um, Nothing can come in except words, which implies that the manifestations of Runsitter have to be done through Ella or something like that. There's nothing you can do to me. You can't eat me because of the Ubik. I can't eat you for a while, but the Ubik will wear off. Uh, Jory explains that he actually creates the entire world in the half-life. And I want to remind you of the thing that I said earlier about how rendering graphics (laughs) on a computer works, where the only part that gets rendered is the part that's visible. That's kind of how Jory operates. <laughs> uh, and there is a game on uh, Internet uh, Second Life. And this half, Half Life, uh, uh, for me, look like this uh, game. Right. Yeah, As that's... I imagine it. I don't know. I didn't play this game, but that's kind of funny. That's you know, that's what Facebook is trying to rebrand into this virtual world. Um, it's yeah. funny to think of it like that, with everybody here having, you know, <laughs> this really, you know, two thousand aughts graphics <laughs> uh, and interacting directly with an Excel sheet. Um, so yeah, Jory talks about how he puts the world together pretty much as needed. <laughs> it's a just in time production. <laughs> he says the world's not very large. It's one hotel in Des Moines, a street outside with a few people in cars, maybe a couple of other buildings thrown in, stores across the street for you to look at when you happen to see out. So you're not maintaining it in New York or Zurich. He's like, why should I? No one's there. Uh, it's not that if a tree, it's funny that if a tree falls in the forest question implies that the forest even exists at all. (laughs) Jory is here to say the forest doesn't exist even (laughs) for the tree to fall in uh, until you go there. Uh, That's how Jory has things constructed. So wherever you and the others went, I constructed a tangible reality corresponding to their minimal expectations. When you flew here from New York, I created hundreds of miles of countryside, town after town, and that was exhausting. (laughs) I had to eat a great deal to make up for all that. So it's basically his graphics processor is running really hot. (laughs) It's consuming a lot of energy, so he has to eat a bunch of half-lifers to make up for it. Uh, That's the reason I had to finish off the others so soon after you got here, just because you took that plane ride. (laughs) Um, there are times especially in some of these final scenes that it really reads like comedy and I, and I always think back I always imagine what Michel Gondry the director thought when he saw the screenplay that was written for this because he wanted to do a production and then he read the screenplay and was like no <laughs> because it's got to be so hard to 
to be honest with the with the text you know to be uh for example the costumes alone would probably would, be hilarious. <laughs> would cause people to look at the film a certain way and i think you would have to play it a little bit like comedy and uh, there are some scenes here towards the end that are really kind of comical they almost come out like when he's like i'm gonna kill you and then he falls <laughs> falls forward immediately <laughs> it says he goes into a half fall forward so it's almost like slapstick um there are more like that too that's not the only one uh the good in that rotoscope like scanner darkly sure yeah yeah hard to do with actual actors even if you did have a lot of green screen because i'm with you once once the people are in the absolutely crazy outfits that are very particularly described people are going to be um sidetracked by that so yeah. either the, the director will leave out those costumes or and the then, director will just pick an interpretation and leave us that see i think that that would be so yeah. it, that okay it's there not going to be able to be as rich as the book is if they if they purge all of that stuff and just made it into a kind of typical sci-fi aesthetic that would be so bad and i think it would just it would make first of all all the fans of ubik really angry <laughs> which is not a good look you know why did you make it look like star wars or something mm -hmm. on the other hand i imagine trying to take seriously a man in a beanie delivering lines in the film <laughs> right? he's round, kind of isn't he it's a lot of people like like Mrs. Wirtz rolls in or whatever the the first yeah, yeah. one hires them. Yeah. She looks like she's a cocoon with her. I mean, their their costumes are so weird. Stanton Mick is also like really short and round. There's a lot of super odd looking people. Yeah. No, I think that to to film it, it would have to be I think it would have to incorporate comedy, but it needs to stay dark as well so that the horror comes through. Um but it would be really a balancing act to get through it and be honest to the book. Um, but yeah, there, I thought about it a lot. I wonder what really, that screen. There's two versions of this in audio book available on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And one, the narrator just um, reads it straight. But in the other, it has like a yellow Ubik book cover on it. That one, the narrator does all these voices for the people. That one is really great. He makes Jory yeah. talk like this. My name is Jory. Sometimes I'm Matt, sometimes I'm Bill, but mostly I'm Jory. <laughs> so he sounds like Rain Man. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one, though. If you've read it all the way through, you could just find that audiobook enjoyable. It's completely free and there was no ads, right, Ajit? Yeah, that's cool. I, I saw that actually. I I didn't bother listening to it yet, but I'm of two minds of the audiobook read uh by an actor. Uh I have a copy of um uh, the Illuminatus trilogy. So Robert Anton Wilson uh and Rick O'Shea. This is a classic weird conspiracy comedy. Um but the audiobook, I, I don't know, I just can't deal with the actor i guess like he does voices and stuff too and it sometimes distracts me so i guess it just depends on the actor um, it depends on the actor and how they do it i can't listen yeah. to the the l sayers ones at all because it feels like they strip the book and they're doing it just dialogue but it can't be because it's seven hours long and i don't believe she really wrote that way it's really it's funny it's i found that it's a characteristic of fiction that i have a hard time doing fiction in audio form because of that when people talk the narrator has to read it out loud and you have to choose like you know do the voice or not do the voices um and if they're not doing the voices then if there's constant dialogue you can get confused about the switch who's, who's speaking yeah. you know so i generally don't listen to fiction in audio format um i guess you really have to have someone acting it uh most of the audiobooks that i listen to are like history or philosophy or something you know other stuff both because if it's a piece of literature and you want to go back and catch the themes and stuff you're you know you're not gonna get it all from an audio books yeah yeah i mean 
it's especially the case here with with fiction because you you know it's kind of really important for you to go through the process of you're building that reality in your head you know uh and it seems like something gets built for you when it's read to you i don't know and it could be just could be just a quirk in my brain but um <clears throat> So uh, sorry if I may if I may interject. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you think about Christopher Nolan as a director of oh, this movie, taking into account uh, that he directed um, Inception yeah. and Tenet? I mean, and I connected this book totally uh, with that, um, especially with the Inception and yeah, uh, Tenet. The really, with, yeah, yeah. Within and Tenet is, I didn't get it really even after he. <laughs> Explained on the blackboard, you know, he took a chalk in his hand and he explained it to us, and I didn't, <laughs> I didn't understand. So it was so humiliating, and I stopped watching Tenet, but I managed to get through the Inception because of the character called Ariadne, and uh, you know, she's the girl who is connected with labyrinths, and that's what her name suggests, right. and. Uh, uh, all the time she's asking questions uh, in who uh, whose dreams uh, whose dream um, is this uh, in in which dream are we now or something like that so she serves like you know our guide uh, through that um, no absolutely i've been thinking about actually I, I very much thought of inception during this are you asking how i would feel about him directing this something like this yeah I think I, he is the only one who could do it. Uh, I don't know. I, have, like I think either him. See, the thing I think that he would do is the thing we were talking about, though. He would modernize it and make it very. In order to maintain the kind of weird, trippy, dreamy. It's not dreamy like Inception. It's dreamy like because things change in ways that like are. Like David Lynch. David Lynch. David then. Lynch. David yeah. Lynch. Or, you know. Okay, did you? A lot of people didn't like it, but did you see Paul Thomas Anderson's Inherent Vice? So, um, that, no, no. I, I think but I think I, about Mulholland Drive or you know, Twin Peaks or something like that. Yeah, this book reminded me of that kind of uh, directors. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's got to have that dreamy sort of uh feeling to it. Um, Hang on one sec. I'm just checking something. Um, Who would you suggest? I mean, as a director, Paul, Paul Thomas think? Anderson. I think. Uh, Thomas Anderson. Mm -hmm. Paul Thomas Anderson. Uh, but I hope if they did do it, they would still keep it as it's supposed to be 1992, so that the audience gets that this is alternate universe and yeah. not, you know, like if they just did it like, because if they modernized it to today, then we're back to, they're going to get rid of all the outrageous costumes that are. Yeah. They're so lovingly described, you know, everyone yeah. wears a hat and the hats are so freaking crazy. All the men wear dresses and maxi skirts and sometimes even pumps, you know, <laughs> like they're way beyond. Uh... Yeah, they could pull that. I mean, they could they could make that kind of like, I don't know, it doesn't have to be the way that we might be imagining it. So, you know, somebody who's if you have, you know, a good costuming department <laughs> they can come up with ways to make it not perhaps look as silly as we think it sounds i don't know um <clears throat> the you know the long like floor length skirt thing could come off like the hakama pants that the aikido well, the men are though dressing that way now like harry styles right. can pull it off um sure. what's his name was was it brad pitt who recently wore a skirt to a opening and um in I'm the not early sure. days of Star Trek, the next generation, they tried to intimate that in the future, people would just wear anything. They had like one scene where Picard and uh, the other guy are wearing skirts and then they look so awkward. They didn't tailor them for men or anything. And so then they ditched that idea. But it does make sense that in the future, there's a lot of cultures where men wear sarongs or kimono or, you know, yeah, yeah. It's, it's just it's some <clears throat> culture wear something that's pants and some that's not it could happen you know <laughs> yeah something in between like those hakama pants those really big huge ones that the like aikido fighter guys wear yeah. um, okay we'll talk more about that though as we go forward 
Uh, by the way, uh, Michel Gondry would actually be a good choice too. He did the Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, and uh, what else? He did other weird stuff. <laughs> yes, yes, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, so Joe asks, why 1939? <clears throat> and it turns out that yes, this apparently is what happens. He can't keep the objects from regressing. Uh, it's implied here that it's even more pronounced because of the group being interwired. <clears throat> he says keeping it, keeping everything up to date was too much for him. He created 1992, but things began to break down, the coins, the cream, the cigarettes, all those phenomena you noticed, and then runs that are kept breaking through from outside and that made it harder. It would be much easier if he hadn't interfered but I didn't worry about the reversion. I knew you'd figure it was Pat Conley. Uh, it would seem like her talent because it's sort of like what her talent does. I thought maybe the rest of you would kill her. I would enjoy that. <laughs> so he's just cruel. He likes playing with them. Yeah, uh, he's a psychopath. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this, this is the, I, I, I put this gif here because this is the scene I was talking about. Uh, What's the point of keeping this hotel and the street outside going for me now? Uh, now that I know. And he says, well, this is how I always do it. So he's just used to doing it this way. Then Joe says, I'm going to kill you. Steps forward in an uncoordinated half falling motion. <laughs> so he immediately stumbles. We could also have used the GIF or the GIF of uh, uh, Sideshow Bob stepping on rakes <laughs> in The Simpsons. <laughs> So, yeah, he falls forward, trying to capture the neck, searching for the bent pipe stem, windpipe, with all his fingers snarling, Jory bit him. Joe feels the pain throughout him. He's eating me, he realized. <clears throat> you can't, he said aloud. He hit Jory on the snout, punching him again and again. The ubic keeps you away. <laughs> it's like the power of Christ compels you. <laughs> the ubic keeps you away. He said as he cuffed Jory's jeering eyes, you can't do it to me. This gum growl drove me crazy. Uh, I even, I, I have a copy of this in Italian. I don't read Italian, but I have a copy of it. Just happened to come across one. And I used it. I, I was able to pick my way through it. I can kind of recognize what's going on. I found the scene and it's the same word. So I was like, is this a misprint or something? No, I think his mouth is just full. He's yeah, exactly. Out. Yeah, that's that's so what I settled on too. He's yeah, on his hand until the pain becomes. He's like, oh yeah, or something. Grom <laughs> growl. <growl. laughs> I can't do it to you, can I? Well, look at me doing it to you. Um, it's like, come and get me. Jory bubbled, working his jaws sideways like a sheep's. <laughs> Again, it's kind of a funny scene somehow, despite the violence grinding Joe's hand until the pain became too much. He kicked Jory. The teeth released his hand. He crept backwards, looking at the blood rising from the punctures made by the troll teeth. Jesus, he said to himself, appalled. Um, yeah, you know who else could do this? Terry Gilliam, but Terry Gilliam has passed on, I, I believe. Um, he did Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, and I couldn't help but read this line in Hunter S. Thompson's voice. Jesus, he said to himself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I I do have the complete works of Hunter S. Thompson audiobook, and the narrator is amazing because he does Hunter S. Thompson's voice, and it's awesome. I love it. It's really great. Is the narrator Johnny Depp? No, no, oh. it's a guy who, I, I think, if I recall correctly, he was friends with, also friends with him. So was Johnny Depp, but. He was friends with Hunter. Um, and yeah, it's really great. Uh, you, can't, you can't do to me what you did to them, says Joe. He finds the spray can of Ubik. He points at the wound and he presses the red plastic uh, stud and a weak stream of particles comes out, settles over his uh, flesh in a film. The pain immediately goes away. Before his eyes, the wound healed. So he uses that last bit of ubic to heal his hand. 
they realize this fight is not going to be resolved. And this is, again, where it's, it's a little bit comical to me because they wind up in this situation where they're like, OK, well, I'll see you later, <laughs> pretty much. I mean, they don't use those exact words, but that's kind of what it is. Uh, Joe says, I'm going downstairs. <laughs> he walks unsteadily. to. The... He's starting to get exhausted, too. After... No, not, not yet. Actually, that's a little bit later. Yeah, he walks uh, to the door. Outside lay the dingy hall. He starts forward, step by step, treading carefully. The floor seems substantial. So it all seems real, basically. Not quasi or irreal world at all. Don't go too far, says Joe. See, it's funny. Don't go too far. <laughs> I can't keep too great an area going. It just it burns my circuits up. If you were to get into one of those cars and drive for miles, eventually you'd reach a point where it breaks down, and you wouldn't like that any better than I do. This is funny. He makes it sound like there's an element of danger if you go off the map. <laughs> um, yes, Vasilya. It's like uh, Truman's show. Yeah, yeah. Truman's show. That, I thought of that too. Um, he solicits the hotel clerk for some company. This is funny. I'm like, the way that it's the first time put, it sounds like he's just kind of testing what Jory is allowing in his world, the way that it says. Uh, so he asks, yeah, are there any ladies you can find me around here? <laughs> this is really scummy. Uh, not at this hotel, sir. This hotel does not pander. You keep a good, clean family hotel. We like to think so, sir. I was just testing you. <laughs> I wanted to be sure what kind of hotel I was staying in. Again, this reminds me of Hunter S. Thompson lines, but... Uh, he left the counter, recrossed the lobby, made his way down the wide marble stairs, through the revolving doors, and went outside. Um, chapter 16 begins, wake up to a hearty, lip-smacking bowl full of nutritious, nourishing, ubic toasted flakes. The adult cereal that's more crunchy, more tasty, more umish. <laughs> ubic breakfast cereal. See, again, more crunchy. Okay. Two syllable words and below. So one and two syllable words would be with ER, right? <laughs> Not that more crunchy is wrong, but crunchier. Crunchier, would... crunchier or tastier, yes. Why why why, yeah. why 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 don't they why why doesn't he use it? That's what I'm saying. It's always just a little bit not always a little bit weird, but frequently it's a little just a little little off. Not wrong. It's not wrong to say more crunchy. <clears throat> it could yeah, be a like stylistic Google choice. Translate, Google Translate or something like that. That's how it sounds. Yeah, me. that's what I'm saying. It feels like some AI is writing copy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Ubic breakfast cereal, the whole bowl taste treat. Do not exceed recommended portion at any one meal. <laughs> <clears throat> Chapter 16. Chip hails a taxi. Asks the driver to drive him around town, hoping to test the limits of the world created by Jory. He sees a pretty girl and convinces her to come to the restaurant with him uh, at a later time. The woman gives him a secret envelope and reveals herself to be Ella Runsetter, Glenn's wife. The envelope contains a certificate for a lifetime supply of Ubik. Joe once again encounters Jory at the pharmacy. And an act of will shows Joe a way to acquire more Ubik. Let's get into it. Uh, he's impressed by the diversity of cars. Uh, many years represented. Many makes, many models. The fact that they mostly came in black could not be laid at Jory's door. This detail was authentic. Yes, I did look into this. It turns out that cars were mostly black then um, for a few reasons. We can talk about it in a sec. How did Jory know that? That's peculiar. Jory's knowledge of the minutia of 1939, a period in which none of us lived except Glenn. So maybe Glenn's memories have something to do with this. Uh, Glenn is the only one who would have been alive at that time. Uh, so yeah, there's this quote from Henry Ford. Any customer can have a car painted any color that he wants so long as it's black. <laughs> and it turns out that there are reasons that have to do with the chemicals used in the paints back then that you could get other colors but it tended not to last um so the dark colors and especially black 
used a kind of paint blended with sort of like tar or like asphalt material that caused it to stay on uh, for a very long time and be, you know, nice and shiny. So that's why you see so many black cars in those old movies. They were mostly indeed black. <clears throat> uh, so the decomposition back to these forms was not his doing. They happened despite his efforts. These are natural atavisms, Joe realized, happening, happening mechanically as Jory's strength wanes. Uh, as the boy says, it's an enormous effort. This is perhaps the first time he's created a world this diverse for so many people at once. It isn't usual for so many half-lifers to be interwired. We've put an abnormal strain on Jory and we paid for it. So he says, let's test out what Jory says as to the early boundary of this quasi world now. He says to the driver, take me a for a ride through town, go anywhere you want. I'd like to see as many streets and buildings and people as possible. And then once you've driven through Des Moines, I want you to drive me to the next town and we'll see that. <laughs> he says, I don't go between towns. <clears throat> I'll be glad to drive you around Des Moines. It's a nice city. You're from out of state, aren't you? Uh, he goes on to say, yeah, I'm from New York, blah, blah, blah. I don't want to talk about the war. <laughs> Driver, are there any houses of prostitution here in Des Moines? So again, he's... <laughs> I don't know if he's like, oh, well, this is the end of my life. <laughs> is he giving up? Or again, is he still testing? Because he continues. Like when he sees Ella Runciter, he's like, hey, hi, you want to hang out? <laughs> um, well, are there I any... kind of love that he was trying to test Jory's limits because yeah. he knows if he can exhaust Jory, that he has a chance to kill him, but he unfortunately gave Jory some Ubix. So. Right, but it just seems like such a, it, it's a very particular choice. I mean, you could do something like, hey, let's open up 300 books and see if all the text is written in them. You know, yeah. like <laughs> that would seems like it would be much more of a trial for Jory, um, you know? Well, maybe Jory's prepubescent or... Yeah, uh, but so he nice. already answered that question when he asked at the hotel. That <laughs> you see what I mean? He's like he keeps trying this particular thing. <laughs> yeah, um, Jay wanted a girlfriend from before. Yeah. And then uh, I remember Runciter made a funny comment in the beginning before they even um, went to Luna, where he was just like, "Yeah, Joe doesn't understand anything." Like they had a a a teep or something like read his mind and they figured out Joe was like too stupid to figure out how to have a relationship. Yeah. He didn't realize that Wendy liked him and all that. Yeah, exactly. When she's in the same room saying, you know, I'm going to marry Joe chip. And he just, he's so ding dong. And then he got, and then he got married in a fit of <laughs> absent mindedness, <laughs> like without even trying, in fact, rather corralled right into it. <laughs> Uh, so the driver says no no houses of prostitution maybe Jory can't manage that because of his youth or maybe he disapproves now he starts to feel tired where am I going what for to prove myself that what Jory told me is true to tr prove to myself that what Jory said is true I already know it's true I saw the doctor wink out yeah the doctor from that scene at the beginning of the chapter vanishes uh, when Jory reveals himself. That should have been enough. All I'm doing this way is putting more of a load on Jory, which increases his appetite. I better give up. This is pointless. Yeah, he might be working against his own best interests here. Um, then he sees a girl on the sidewalk moving with a slow, easy gait. She seemed to be window shopping, a pretty girl with gay blonde pigtails, wearing an unbuttoned sweater over her blouse, a bright red skirt and high-heeled little shoes. Slow the cab, he says. <laughs> there, by that girl with the pigtails. So he's going to triple check <laughs> just to make sure. Does he think that she's, you know, <laughs> does he think that she's a prostitute? I don't know. He attempts to pick her up. He says, hi. She looks at him and says, yes. And then he says, I'm going to die. <laughs> Again, this really just reads like comedy. Hi, miss. Yes, I'm going to die. <laughs> <laughs> and the cab driver's like, don't listen to him. He's just trying to pick you up. Um, he offers to take her to dinner to the Matador, 
we'll have braised fillet of Martian mole cricket. Then he realizes that that doesn't exist in this reality. Market steak, I mean. <laughs> beef, you like beef? Getting into the cab, the girl says to the driver, he wants to go to the matador. Okay. So the driver apparently drives in that direction. Care for a lucky strike? The girl asks him, extending her pack towards him. They're toasted, as the slogan goes. So this is where you immediately start to see that she knows about the future. The phrase LSMFT won't come into existence until... So yeah, she knows it's a lucky strike, mighty fine tobacco is the was the ad. Yeah. Um, I thought their toasted was later too. I mean, that's just based on watching Mad Men. <laughs> yeah, this is also an ad for buying war bonds. It said, protect the Constitution, buy war bonds. Um, oops, okay. So then she drops all the pretense. I'm not a deformation of juries. I'm not like him. Uh, or these little old stores and houses in this dingy street, all these people in their Neolithic cars. Here, Mr. Chip. So she gives him this envelope. She says, open it right away. I don't think either of us should have delayed so long. Uh, From the company that manufactures Ubik, the girl said, it's a guarantee of a free lifetime supply. Free because I know your problem regarding money. <laughs> uh, your, shall we say, idiosyncrasy. So for those who don't know, an idiosyncrasy is something particular to a person. Uh, it can be a behavior, a facial tick, a way of dressing, any number of things, uh, a kind of individual characteristic. So his inability to manage money is his one of his idiosyncrasies. <clears throat> it's funny because she's thinking, even in Half-Life, you're going to wind up indigent. <laughs> uh, what happens to someone who's homeless in cold pack? <laughs> Uh, and a list on the reverse of all the drugstores which carry it. Two drugstores, not abandoned, in Des Moines are listed. I suggest we go to one first before you eat dinner. So she gives the driver instructions, and they head for this pharmacy. Who are you? She says, my name's Ella. Ella Hyde Runciter, your employer's wife. Uh, you're here with us on this side. You're in cold pack. He says to her, as if she didn't know this. <laughs> Hey, you're Ella. <laughs> uh, as you well know, I've been for some time, Ella says. Fairly soon, I'll be reborn into another womb, I think. At least Glenn says so. I keep dream dreaming about a smoky red light, and that's bad. That's not a morally proper womb to be born into. She laughs a rich, warm laugh. Um, by the way, now I just thought of another director who could do it. Uh, Gaspar Noy, <laughs> the guy who does Enter the Void, uh, that he could pull this off, I think. His stuff's really dark, though. You're the other one, says Joe. Joy is destroying us. You're trying to help us. Behind you, there's no one, just as there's no one behind Jory. I've reached the last entities involved. This was kind of funny to me. Uh, I mean, odd. She says caustically, I don't think of myself as an entity. <laughs> I think of myself as Ella Runciter, but it's true. He says, yes, she says somberly. What, I, I, what is this uh, hesitancy? <laughs> she doesn't want to be referred to as an entity. And then it's like, well, yeah. Well, that's an acknowledgement that she's dead, like a spirit, like a ghost, but she's still See, that's not, I don't read the word entity like that. I guess that might be how she's thinking of it though, yeah. Because, I mean, there is such thing as a legal entity. I mean, it's like... A, a, it's a thing, not a person. And that's why she doesn't like it. My my college No, it has, has agency. Is that the idea, though? Go ahead. My college professor was like, that's why... He believed in ghosts. And he was like, that's why people are ghosts. Because they just can't, you know, move on. They, they don't want to get reborn. They're, they're looking for their Diet Coke and whatever. And a little bit... Ella is like that. She could mm. have been reborn, but she wanted to be connected to the business. And that was her request in her will that she yeah. be revived every time they could talk about it. So she's still very much attached to her personality. She doesn't want to dissipate into the nothingness and go back to energy and get reborn. She wants yeah. to be Ella. That's something I wanted to talk about later too, probably in the in the final session, but confronted with 
cosmic realities these people are like i gotta run i gotta get that paper <laughs> i gotta continue to run the business i mean that's some serious focus and determination like you found out that there's such a thing as reincarnation you're like in the half half dead world and you're still saying what about the spreadsheets <laughs> that's pretty funny um okay so yeah maybe if she's thinking entity like spirit but i just you know it's like a being that's what i think of when uh, i think so of entity. Sorry for it. yes i think she she was speaking in terms of um as you said a, a person mm -hmm. or personality uh and uh what was the last thing the, the, like which a, you said sorry, uh, like entity. a spirit uh -huh, a being being i yeah. think being yeah yeah being yeah. Uh, like um until in all in an ontological yeah uh, ter term yeah that just that the term yeah because she identifies herself as ella and everybody around her recognized her as ella and therefore she, it is confirmed to her that she is ella she got that confirmation from the yeah. external world whatever that world is i mean right she's like don't movie. strip me of my don't strip me yeah. of my ellenness <laughs> my ellen yes that's some yes it is connected with her existence uh, yeah i think so i mean there's a lot of topics so <laughs> yeah yeah know, just meandering we are just meandering like that continues uh, that continues in this part too uh because even now she's like when i'm reborn Glenn won't be able to consult with me. <laughs> Clearly, that's the priority here. I have a very selfish, practical reason for assisting you, Mr. Chip. So here she makes, she goes out of her way to let him know that she doesn't have any kind of moral or ethical <laughs> dog in the fight. She's like, no, 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 you need to replace me. Who's going to advise Glenn? Uh, and by the way, it doesn't entirely make sense because Joe is not known for his wisdom He's maybe a good technician and an engineer, but is he able to test <laughs> while he's in the half-life? You know, is he able to test people using his equipment? That doesn't seem like that would be possible, but no, I don't know. It seem like it'd be possible, but they're like the inside out of that saying where people say, well, you're on your deathbed and nobody ever said, oh, I wish I'd gone to that extra meeting. They always think they mm -hmm. should have spent with their family but not these people they're like, right right, oh, right. Hopefully i could work a little bit more right right they're on their deathbed and they're like hey can you pencil me in for three o'clock on wednesday <laughs> i still got a few meetings left in me uh so yeah she says i want you to provide glenn with advice and assistance uh you'll be ideal you'll be doing in half-life what you did in full life so not really, though. In a sense, I'm not motivated by no noble sentiments. Uh, I saved you from Jory for good common sense reason, she added. And God knows I detest Jory. So maybe she's also just being a bit modest here. And she actually does have noble sentiments, but she's trying to dress it up like, no, 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 no. I'm just, you know, think nothing of it. I'm just being selfish. Um, also, I hate Jory. <laughs> that can be motivation enough for sure. <laughs> Joe says, oh, this is interesting. Joe says, I'll have Glenn get the, the owner to move Jory out of the moratorium. Excuse me, let me just have a drink here. Glenn has no authority to do that. Uh, won't Vogelsong? And then we get this piece of information. Herbert is paid a great deal of money annually by Jory's family. <laughs> so Jory is like a rich kid who is just allowed to terrorize people who are less rich than he is. <laughs> That's pretty much the deal. <laughs> Herbert is exquisitely evil in that case. He's literally just providing torture subjects for a spoiled rich demon. <laughs> uh, so yeah, he's paid a lot of money to keep him with the others <clears throat> and to come up with reasons for doing so. This is why <laughs> he pushed against putting Ella in solitary cold pack, which apparently he did not do anyway. He did not mm -hmm. listen. Um, 
So he says there are joys in every moratorium. So this is not uncommon. This battle goes on wherever you have half-lifers. It's a verity, a rule of our kind of existence. So that's interesting. He could have gone on to write a whole series of books <laughs> involving Joris. <laughs> they arrive at the drugstore. Uh, Ella says, I'm not going in with you. Uh, goodbye. Thanks for your loyalty to Glenn. Thanks for what you're going to be doing for him. She kisses him on the cheek. Her lips seem rife with ripe with life. Uh, some of it was conveyed to him. He felt stronger. Good luck with Jory, she says, her purse on her lap. He, uh, did I skip that part? Maybe it's later, where he's like, we were still going to do that dinner, though. <laughs> Maybe that's after. He goes into the uh, drugstore, and there's a bald pharmacist. He says, I'm afraid we're closing, sir. I was just coming to lock the door. But I'm in, and I want to be waited on. Uh, Joe pretty quickly figures out that it's Jory, because every time he pushes for getting his Ubik, the pharmacist comes up with an excuse as to why that it's not possible. Oh, well, we don't carry that, or I think we're out of it. And Joe kind of strong arms his way into the situation. Then he says, Jory. The pharmacist says, sir, you're Jory. I can tell now. I'm learning to know him when I encounter him, he thinks. You invented this drugstore and everything in it except for the Ubik. You have no authority over Ubik. That comes from Ella. Uh, this confused me a little. He says, I've regressed all the Ubik in the store. So does that mean he stops putting the effort because remember, the regression happens on its own. It's the effort that stops the regression. Again, there's this inverse thing that happens that we were talking about before with like thermo thermodynamics and entropy. But it seems like sometimes here the cold is the active principle, not the heat. And I was annoyed with Joe though earlier when he didn't, he just kept getting message after message after message to use Ubic. And then he I had. Know. And instead of using it, he sells it to the pilot. And I have long wondered, like, what if he had just taken it? You know, like, do we know that just because it's regressed, it doesn't work? Because Apparently, like, because I think I think that's because of the oleander and stuff like that, that he saw in the ingredients. And he was like, well, I'm not taking that. No, um, I know that was the reason said, but yeah, that, yeah. You know, it doesn't work that just was you know that could have just been dramatic tension <laughs> right i mean clearly those are not the actual ingredients in this substance that will revert you to a different time period um so yeah no i i thought so too it was very frustrating like the thing is sitting right next to you the whole time you just need to take it yeah mm -hmm. um but apparently i don't know it's it at least fools joe here uh <laughs> to say that he's regressed all the ubic um Maybe it's a total bluff that Joe fell for, you know? That's what I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, I even found this kidney liver cure bottle. <laughs> uh, that's the liver and kidney balm. Uh, he starts trying to will it into the current version. He says, I can bring it up to the present, to 1992. Can you, Mr. Chip, says the pharmacist. Uh, here you are. He gives him a cardboard box. Open it, and you'll see. Uh, so Joe is now <laughs> doing this. I can make you current. You are a spray can. <laughs> see, this is really reading his comedy once again. You're a spray can, Joe says to the container, <laughs> which he holds in his hand. This is 1992. He tries to exert everything. He puts his entirety of himself into the effort. So he's really Somehow straining. Somehow Jory learned how to do it. So I guess it's possible to do. Like, that was my thing in the beginning when he said there's two forces working, one for us and one against. Right. I was thinking, okay, so consciousness is caused by like us defeating entropy because we're holding ourselves together. But of course that can't go on forever. We die. And then once we die, we disintegrate and become earth and, you know, seeds grow in us, animals eat that and the whole thing starts all over again. So in a really 
basic sense of matter repositioning itself, repurposing itself, there is such thing as reincarnation, just not the way people want it to be, not the way where it's like you remember your Uncle Joe and you can remember the past sure. or whatever. So that's what I think is going on. I think the ubic is made out of something that's holding them together, consciousness. Yeah, yeah. It gets, it updates them. It brings them into the now, um, which is, per Philip K. Dick, the only thing that actually exists is the now. Um, that's for a later conversation, though. But yeah. Um, so yeah, he tries to will it. Yeah, if, if Jory was able to do it, then other people, I guess, should be able to. Maybe you get experience you get experience yeah you get good at half-life <laughs> um, you get some experience points and level up yep you... and somebody made the ubic it was made in their time nothing can come through to their world except that's right. words that's right uh and it is mentioned later on that some other half-lifers along with ella so i guess they banded together and they figured out what they can do i don't know maybe it's you know it's well, like jory's working for the forces of evil so he keeps himself together by eating other people's consciousness so i think ubik is also made of consciousness but it's just less evil because it's not made of um taking people's consciousness it's just made up of leftover consciousness laying around <laughs> i mean we could put it into the the good and evil binary but i think it won't I, work i would even hold back a little bit and just say that jory is a sadist and there's nothing that stands behind him that's like they put it specifically like that um and then people are standing up to him that's it you know like they band together and they've figured out something that they could do um to make the ubic uh but yeah yeah that's We'll get more into that later, too. So again, Joe is continuing with his experiment. What I hold here is a spray can, he says. No, nope, I'm sorry, it's it's not. <laughs> so he's really trying. So he sets the container down. Then he turns and begins the long, slow journey across the drugstore. This is a funny scene. So the you know, pharmacist Jory is standing at the door with the keys, like, come on, can we get out of here, please? And he gives up. He's like, fine. He puts the box down. It starts walking across the drugstore. Uh, goes outside. Behind him, the pharmacist comes out. Locks the door. Joe says, I think I'll complain to the manufacturer <laughs> about the, the your regress drugstore. <laughs> That's the complaint. Uh, he is starting to really feel that exhaustion at this point the same one that he felt before. He manages to get onto a bus or it was like a trolley or something. Uh, so while he's on the bus, he leans back and closes his eyes and then arriving uh, like an angel of salvation. Uh, his call was heard. I was thinking about this in quasi religious terms, like his effort was a sort of prayer right you know exactly. yeah that's what i was gonna say faith is the uh substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen so yeah yeah because faith if you and believe you, can, you know stay together you'll stay together but if people are telling you it can't be done it can't be done it's a lot harder to keep your faith yeah you know, their story telling him nope no it's just old <laughs> yeah you're gonna <laughs> yeah you're gonna there's no point in fighting it eventually the ubik's going to wear off and that's going to be it um and even jury would dissipate if it weren't for his wealthy family continuing to get him access to other yeah uh, yeah movies. yeah he consumes other beings yeah vasilia yes well um it's interesting that uh as an angel of salvation there are girls and it's maybe because um Phil K. Dick uh needed uh, like he wanted a, a girl because he had uh, uh bad experiences with uh, his wife so that's so that's something that does 
come up in some documentaries and things I've watched about him where he was kind of a man child. He was looking for a mother figure <laughs> in a lot of respects. Uh, he had, you know, as we've said, he had a lot of problems and he tended to gravitate towards people who also had problems. So he had tumultuous relationships. Yes, Alex. Uh, I also wanted to add, add something with regard to uh, yeah, uh, what, uh, what was Vasily uh, said, uh, and I agree that uh, Dick is definitely uh, searching for a mother figure or mother savior figure yeah. or holy mother. But uh, do you know when you say man eater, it always refers to women, you know? Or a man lion. So, <laughs> you know, she's a man eater, you know that song. And yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Now it confuses me um, because this I, I call him Joffrey, you know, this said is the this yeah. little said I constantly call him Joffrey because of Oh Game because of, of Game of Thrones, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's the same like Joffrey and I, yeah. I, I cannot you know force myself to say Jory, but Joffrey Jory. <laughs> right, that's Jory. good. Uh, I could picture him being played yeah, by that I same kid totally the guy would be an excellent actor for that part sure, i mean, sure jeffrey you know that kid uh quit the show because he or he was glad when the show en- when his part ended because people would see him in real life and hate him yeah yeah <laughs> i heard yet yeah, he even suffered um, some um, mental breakdown because yeah, yeah. Uh, other kids were abused him uh, were abusing him at school at, ho- at the college he was 16 yeah, yeah. years old though something like no, that. No, I know. I When I heard that story, I was like, that's terrible. But then I was like, on the other hand, if I saw him, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> if I ran yes, into him in the street. <laughs> you know, yes, sorry for this digression, but do you remember when Mina Hidi, who plays Cersei, when she said uh, that uh, she, she didn't know whom to, uh, uh, she should be more afraid of, the people who say, hey, you bitch, uh, I hate you, or the people who said, uh, oh, I adore your character because, you know. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> yeah he was a total psycho ramsey had the same problem especially with the fans who said oh i, I adore your character and mm. then he, right. you know, he stopped laughing because <laughs> it was just not funny anymore for him yeah. yeah could you imagine the people who run into joffrey in the street and they're like oh my god i love you so much yeah. <laughs> you're great <laughs> uh, that guy that guy is perfect uh, for this role yeah, if yeah, he yeah. ever uh, decides to return to acting because i heard that he is he graduated uh, yeah, he in philosophy or something or even theology mm-hmm. or something like that yeah i mean that's where you got to go after all that it's <laughs> <He's laughs> philosophy definitely. or theology <laughs> yeah definitely um so yeah, this woman arrives, bending over him in the darkness, a girl in a synthetic ostrich leather coat. So she's from the modern times. Uh, he looks up at her. Mr. Chip, she says. Uh, pretty and slender, dressed in hat, gloves, suit, and high heels. She holds something in the outline of a package. Of New York, of Rensselaer Associates. I don't want to give this to the wrong person. I'm Joe, he says. For a moment, he thought the girl might be Ella, but he had never seen her before. <clears throat> so this has to be someone who's also in half life. I guess they come up with some facilities to produce the ubic, you know, like there there has to be a world that's not constituted by jewelry because half life existed before jewelry existed and it it wouldn't make sense to say that the only world that exists unless every world that exists in in this reality is constituted by a jury. <laughs> um, no, it's just um, acknowledging the fact that if he can make up worlds, then other people right. can't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have to be kind of strong. Like Ella says, there's one of him, and every. It's like if you've ever worked in a workplace, and there's always like one difficult employee. Like before COVID, it seemed like that was just always the case, you know. And right. you wonder, you're here eight hours a day. Why does that person have to make life so miserable? You know. Yeah. <laughs> So I think um, I think anybody can make a world, but not everybody has the same charismatic personality. Not everybody has power. And I think if people band together, even if they're less charismatic, maybe they can. So they're they're hiding somewhere from Jory because yeah. there's a factory and he doesn't know about it. He was like, but I yeah, can't they... understand where the Ubik's coming from because, you know. It is mentioned that they experience each other's worlds. 
people who are in close proximity. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, and Jory doesn't have all the power. He doesn't, he's not able to, you know, nullify their worlds. Um, so, yeah, maybe this is a technician who worked in <laughs> either in the uh, inertial industry or the telepath industry of, in some fashion. That's the other thing. We figured out there's some crossover because before they ever went to Luna, almost every person on their trip had been contacted by Jory in a dream. Yeah. So, um, yeah, he's able to reach out to inertials yeah. and telepaths. So Jory is powerful for sure. But I guess it's, you know, this sort of cannibalistic power, <laughs> the power of eating I other souls. That things are not clearly like this world and that world. There's a little bit of crossover. Like he yeah. can't physically reach into the other world. He can't physically eat people who are alive. Right. But he can send them messages and you can they, get into their dreams. Yeah. And they may not know what those messages really are. Cause a lot of people think anything they hear from the other world is like better. So I had this friend and he always liked to boast on how at his restaurant one day he came in before anyone else was in and he saw a message and it was from his aunt who had passed away. And he would always tell this story in this real woo woo way, but I just couldn't stop laughing. And I was like, but if your great aunt Stella wasn't an accountant when she was alive, why does she know anything now? <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> he's dead and he didn't like that because he wanted it to be like this special story. And a lot right. of people like that. But when I read this book, I think that's what Jory is. He's just dead, but that doesn't mean he's smart and he has yeah. special answers for anyone. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Ajit, you wanted to say I didn't, something? I didn't catch that before. Kamara, you're suggesting that the dream that the inertials shared was actually Jory. Yeah. Yeah, but he said, sometimes I call myself Matt, sometimes I call myself J Bill, but mostly I'm Jory. And Tippy Jackson, I think, was the one where she's asleep most of the time, and we meet her, and she's having a dream, and she has a specific talent that she's anti against, and so one of the people, that Matt, is like, I can't be myself around you. The other one, Bill, has a different um, talent, and so they start quoting Shakespeare to her, and she thinks that is yeah. so odd because i didn't read that play and so there's a, a clue there for them that it's not really a dream that someone else outside yeah. of themselves like you can't solve a problem on the same level you started somebody gave you other information yeah but none of them like know what to do with that at the time. so off right. they go to luna anyways yeah no, no but that's that that just because you mentioned the two names now i make that connection otherwise I had not realized that. I thought the two names were actually different psi forces uh, from Hollis really interfering with the inertias, inertials or inertias, inertials. So what you're saying is that, nope, no, 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 um, Jory, by revealing those two names is indicating he was that force that punched through to the real world, which comes back to the coins that might have. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It does seem to be the case that Jory is able to at least reach out to uh, people who are telepathic or inertials uh, in their. Uh, excuse me, excuse me for interrupting, uh, uh, but without raising my hand because I'm on the phone, so it's not easy to raise the hand. It's okay, it's okay. Uh, uh, I just wanted to say Jory is the architect of um, of the that dream. It, it, I mean, it all looks like it's a Jory's dream because, you know, he's the one who has to put effort to build, uh, to build the restaurant, to build the streets, uh, to, to even to, to build a pharmacy and the pharmacist. He's the grand architect. like from the <clears throat> Right, and, but he must uh, not be the architect of everything, though. That's the thing. I don't know how he, borders he, he, and boundaries work there, uh, you know. Uh, but if it if what if if uh, this is all his dream, this is you know. Well, then why and, would he why would he allow Ubik to be produced in his dream? Then that's the problem, you know, because that's that's mm -hmm. his that's anathema to him. I, I, have a, 
a comment that might be consistent with Alex's idea. Why the 1939 base? The yeah, 1939 base could imply that it is one person's natural original starting points, that they envision the world and it all starts there, and you have to build up on it. to. Keep... So it, otherwise, I, I'm not so sure why, because it was yeah. 1939 when Half-Life was invented, and therefore everything, no. That's what I thought, because... You know, we know that um, people buried themselves like within remembered history, but it's considered barbaric, so it hasn't happened for a while. So if 1939 was when Half-Life was invented and we're in 1992, that was one theory I had. And then another theory I had is some people think of 1939 historically as like the birth of the modern world. It's like the mm. year before World War two started and like i don't know maybe that was why <laughs> hmm. yeah i was wondering that too um maybe it's just the kind of maybe it's the average of all of the people's memories that are in half-life <laughs> i don't know yes Vasily. well maybe it is because of uh, glenn Ransiter, because yeah yeah there's that too. Uh, his wife was maybe the first uh, like uh, half-lifer and uh, he finds out that or something like that but uh, he finds out that uh, for Jory in 1992, Jory wasn't before uh, he communicated with Alan Normal, and then Jory was like in some modern. Time. I don't know. I think that Jory has been around for a while, though. Um, he's just kind of kept himself secret, but wanted to talk to the outside world and was taking over calls the vogel saying he knew about jory so jory's a known entity i mean i mean of course he does it says that he accepts money to allow jory to cannibalize the souls of others uh <laughs> so i don't know about about ella being the first half-lifer i don't think that's the case it is mentioned though that uh this could be associated with with uh, Runsitter's memories. Um, that is stated at some point, or there's a slight implication, because he's the only one who was alive in 1939. Um, yes, Alex, did you want to say something? Yes, I wanted to to ask you: Did you encounter any um, clue about uh, um, about um, about Jory? Philip K? Uh -huh. <laughs> no, no, about uh, uh, just a moment now. I lost my thought while you were talking. Uh, I, I lost my, my question. Uh, did you encounter any, um, any clue in the book uh, why Jory uh, does not want to be reborn? Uh, you know, mm. because Ella, uh, because he's also uh, sticking to, you know, holding so preciously to his persona just like she she i mean, I mean if they mentioned carl jung it is not accidentally i think yeah and, definitely not uh, definitely not so there is some clue in well i think it's my impression when and this is without anything being said directly about it is it's just the tendency of the human to hold on to an ego identity <laughs> you know you, you don't want to let it go immediately it takes some time Maybe you never want to let it go. And Jory. Jory is your persona, you know, because she, I think that Ella embraced that persona that she's Glenn, Glenn Rossiter's wife. And that's her persona. And she's uh, running, she's actually running the business as far as I understood. So mm. maybe, maybe it is, uh, uh, but, but what about Jory? I mean, he, uh, he needs energy. He needs more energy to feed himself. Mm -hmm. but he doesn't want to be reborn. He doesn't want to be materialized. Yeah, he's so having too much fun. <laughs> For him, hurting people is fun. That's The idea is he's a sadistic spirit. You know? Well, I don't know. It, more, it, it reminds me more of uh, Freud and his, you know, id, uh, ego, and superego. Yeah. Uh, thing, you know, he, like he is the id and Ella is some kind of uh, superego. Mm. I don't know. Didn't Freud say that the uh, the id is silent, or is that Lacan? I can't remember. <laughs> that it's that 
it doesn't have words it's like an unstructured chaotic thing you know uh yeah, i don't know i don't know and who's who's the super ego so there <laughs> who has yeah. the unreasonable demands yes vasilia Well, maybe Jory was sent in half life by his family. No, yeah, on purpose, <laughs> <laughs> right? They're like, we cannot deal with this. How about you go to daycare permanently? <laughs> well, yeah. That's an excellent idea, yeah. Get of Jory, yeah. That Jory, would be a great Jory. prequel story of how Jory came to be in half life and his parents that's, couldn't stand well, that's him. That's what I think, that he's just really <laughs> immature and it. Yeah. it out pictures as his sadism like little boys that pull the wings off a fly or something and yeah, yeah. Just, he doesn't want to get reborn because he's his parents are making his life pretty good here in half yeah, yeah. and it's all like, bets are off when you get reborn yeah you might come back and you might wind up as a hungry ghost or who knows what seems pretty likely for him in fact um so uh, Joe goes ahead and uses some of the spray, and she says, wow, you didn't have to use as much this time. You must be getting stronger. Um, <clears throat> she mentions that she's a factory representative uh, and technical consultant. She gives the technical explanation of how the Ubic works. I didn't include it here. Maybe we'll talk about it later. It's kind of interesting. It's, you know, jargony, but sounds cool. <laughs> it's hard to do uh sort of sci-fi jargon and make it sound really compelling uh because you can find cases of writers doing it badly you know um who invented ubic yes ajit uh yeah the technical jargon is um it's hard to do technical jargon well like uh yeah yeah uh neil stevenson does it and with proximate technology but it's i think it takes a lot of homework to do something like that in sure. this case it's done almost like a parody because the the hero quickly punches through and says wait a second ions are always negative what are you talking about right <laughs> yeah his usual compulsion apparently to be uh, yeah, yeah to 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 make a correction but that means the person pushing, the author pushing forward this technical explanation, it is a parody. It's not supposed to be correct. It's that, you know, it'd be harder to make a, you know, a correct, because Half-Life doesn't exist. It'd be, it's an imagined. Right. Well, you have to, you, like, the, the, the key to making the good jargon is to mix in some bits of actual scientific jargon and then, you know, and then include some new things like protophasic particles or whatever it was <laughs> protophasic beams uh and things like that yeah maybe that uh maybe he did notice a, a flaw in her explanation and it turns out that the whole thing is just meant to be convincing that's the important part <laughs> sounded good didn't it joe <laughs> and then he's like no it did not <laughs> uh so yeah, who invented Ubik? A number of responsible half-lifers whom Jory threatened. So yeah, he was menacing all of them and they apparently sort of banded together. I don't know. Uh, principally, Ella Runciter. It took her and them working together a long, long time. <clears throat> so this has been going on for years. There still isn't much of it available as yet. <clears throat> Ebbing from him in her trim covert way, she continued to retreat and then by degrees was gone. Ah, here's, yeah, he calls her to dinner in the future. At the Matador, I understand Jory did a good job materializing it or regressing it just right, whatever it is he does. Uh, he listened, but the girl did not answer. Carefully carrying the spray can of Ubik, Joe Chip walked outside to greet the evening traffic, searching for a cab under a streetlight. He held up the spray can, read the printing on the label, which immediately sends him a message. I think her name is Myra Laney. Look on the reverse side for address and phone number. Thanks, he says to the spray can. Again, that's pretty funny. Um, and he immediately, yes, Vasile. Well, uh, about mother figure, well, uh, here the girl, she walks like retreats, same as Ella. It's like something uh, there in half-life that uh, is out of uh, material reach, and a material like uh, out of his reach, uh, out just of out of reach, reach always, yeah. 
<clears throat> he probably even once finding this phone number and address it will still remain out of his reach forever <laughs> he immediately waxes profound <laughs> right so he thinks right away this is like almost a non sequitur he goes from getting the oh the name and address is on the other side of the can he says thanks can and then he says to himself we are served by organic ghosts who speaking and writing pass through our new environment watching wise physical ghosts from the full life world elements of which have become for us invading but agreeable splinters of a substance that pulsates like a former heart all of them he thought thanks to glenn runciter the writer of instructions labels and notes valuable notes so that's what i'm saying like he just suddenly comes through with this clarity and like it's just like this really sudden well-written thought um well here this feels almost like if joe chip is philip k dick kind of yeah, yeah. Um, having yeah. this lucid thought where a lot of people have this kind of magical thinking when it comes to pattern recognition or um coincidence and so you know one of my friends is like no you can't tell me there's no such thing as god because i was driving on the street and i had this sudden thought that i should turn and then i turned and then the bridge was being destroyed and i would have died if i'd gone straight and so she's like this paragraph she's like some wise physical ghost gave her this idea to turn the other way and you know yeah like yeah but maybe you just got lucky like if you had gone the other way we wouldn't be having this conversation because you would be dead and every time you reimagine this situation you can put a few more frills on it and make it seem like more magical you know yeah but that's the funny thing about this this goes back to that sort of demystified world where in a technological twist of fate uh he is here in the half-life and for him organic living beings are ghosts it's like a mirror image you know right right it, but I, I do think philip k dick lived in a world where um you know we we got to remember they they hadn't quite seen um you know the 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 protons they didn't have like the john webb telescope you know there, there was a lot he didn't know so uh, yeah, yeah. Lived in that time period and you i'm not saying he was evangelical or anything but he could have had a nominal belief in spirituality and oh yeah for sure he stuff did like that you know? i need to i need to get i need to cobble together a better timeline of his like his epiphany and how that maybe how that relates to these stories I think a lot that, of people who do LSD and those kind of mind altering drugs yeah, come out wanted, of it yeah, saying, yeah. you know, we're sure. actually you've got your each other. You've got your Timothy Leary's, your Ram Dasses, your yeah. Robert yeah, Wilson's, you know, I know for sure. Um but yeah, yeah. And then as more and more scientific things get discovered, for me anyways, it seems harder and harder to go with the magical thinking right. because like with gun control these people were saying thoughts and prayers thoughts and prayers and yeah yeah like, exactly if exactly prayer worked if i was a deeply religious person if prayer worked then i would have to believe that maybe god's okay with all these mass shootings because they just keep happening you know or whatever you know they, yeah, yeah. they're saying not in my time but god's time so me you know either that or i would lose my faith but you know i'm just assuming for the sake of argument they don't want to lose their faith and and so i mean to me there's a lot of evidence <laughs> to uh to lose your faith but <laughs> sure but no, some I... people stubbornly refuse to lose their faith so <laughs> of course no i mean that's also probably a topic for the next session but uh yeah, I mean, Philip K. Dick was certainly somebody who had a mystical experience that affected him deeply and for the rest of his life. Um, he also had a bit more than the turning down the bridge experience uh, where he was told that his son had a specific medical condition and would die. And he rushed his son to the hospital and they looked and they found that condition exactly and saved his son's life. So like it was a certain kind of hernia that could end up 
becoming infected and oh wow he wrote that into the book i was reading last night which is supposed to be a fiction book but he made it happen to a different character that's crazy uh -huh. which book are you reading i think it's called valis valis yeah 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 valis is for him a real valis is the story of his epiphany actually hmm. that is yeah yeah that is absolutely that's crazy yeah it so really is my explanation for that with the girl on the bridge is everything is i'm like okay maybe well, i mean that's on some level just sensed the seismic activity of the earth in the same right. way i mean that's just zagging when you and that's just zagging when you should have zigged or whatever that's yeah, not like a, i mean i don't know it doesn't have to be god <laughs> though i'll buy that it's something we currently don't understand but then i'd rather look for an explanation because to me that's just cheating when people say um well you can't explain what made the big bang so there has to be a god yeah. i feel yeah, like yeah. no you're still not explaining it you're just adding an extra step because then we have to play that game and say well what invented god you know so yeah, yeah. <laughs> not solving anything by yeah, adding absolutely. it to the equation it's but funny by like the way something else that occurred to me was um that jory is kind of like uh do you know about Berkeley, the same Berkeley that UC Berkeley is named for? He was a philosopher who, uh, so like a big problem back then was how, do, how does the mind interact with, phys, with the physical world? Um, and uh, like even the physical body, like where does the little, where's that transition happening? And uh, so like one solution was done by Berkeley who came up with something like a sort of divine solipsism that's like you're not alone other entities exist but it's kind of like god is there mediating the whole thing to you so in a way you are in your own universe and god's kind of rendering things like jory does for you he's like holding everything together um it's interesting that berkeley is named after that guy in particular <laughs> i i gave a very crude explanation of his thought i wouldn't say i buy into his thought but on the other hand, he's worth reading. It's just interesting. But in some ways, if you get crazy about it, like neurologically speaking, you can never control someone else's perception. So no matter how articulate I think I'm being at this moment, I have no control over if you heard me say something else and you leave here thinking, oh, she's just crazy. She said the stupidest thing. She said <laughs> ABC. And if I saw a recording of it and I said, no, I didn't say ABC. I said DEF, you know, you weren't listening, but that's the thing. Yes, our world is made up of our perceptions. So if I yeah. walk around the world thinking, you know, that person's coming their hair because they want me to think they look good. And that person is coming their hair because they're coming their hair. They don't even know I exist, you know? Everybody's <laughs> <laughs> life is the, is a little bit what you are making of it, but that can make sure. you crazy if you think about it too much. <laughs> no, absolutely. Uh, sorry, are you, are you arguing that there is no objective reality, only a subjective reality. <laughs> this is, that is that stuff we're going to probably have to get into next time because we're going to go way off the rails. We're, That's we're definitely. We really, really have to prepare for that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, Vasily. Uh, what um, Kumari said uh, is that spelled like um, what? Uh, it's uh, sorry, but uh, it, it, uh, it is spelled like Kumari. It, that's the name. Yeah. Kumari. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, uh, uh, you said that uh, the life, our life is like our perceptions. Well, it's actually what uh, here, what uh, um, here Dick uh, implied, because uh, like Joe, when he, he like believes that something happened, so, um, and like that turns out, uh, he had a perception, like some, that he will survive, that he must survive. And he, like in this book, he survived. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's yeah. a combination of your um, memories and the physical. I definitely don't think it's all under your control because if it was, then racism wouldn't exist, misogyny wouldn't exist. You know, people would just will it into Ubik and it wouldn't exist. So it's not all under your control, but of the things that happen to you like if 
two kids attended the same birthday party. You know, it, it is a combination of like the events that happened, their memories, their belief system, and their, you know, their perception of it. It's all those things. Yeah. Yeah. Again, that's, so I have some thoughts on that, but it really would derail the whole, <laughs> the whole finishing up with the book. Um, like when you talk about belief systems, there's, you know, overtly taught systems of interaction and belief, but there's also this simple fact of inculcation into a culture and into a language or languages that has a definite effect on how you experience things. Uh, anyway, that's, we'll get into that next time. <laughs> We're reaching the end here. Yeah, he comes up with this very lucid and it's very like poetically written also. We are served by organic ghosts. Like he suddenly snaps too. Um, did he have some Ubik just now? Yeah, he did, didn't he? I can't remember. <laughs> yeah, I thought the person gave it to him. Yeah, but did he spray himself? That's the thing. Is that why he suddenly became lucid? I don't think it says that he sprayed himself. No, um, she did, because yeah. she said you didn't need as much now, so you're getting stronger. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's right. So that's that right. Yeah, in fact, she them. even applies it and she says, would you like me to apply it? I am, after all, the technical <laughs> expert on the stuff. So, yeah, I guess that's where his clarity is coming from. So our brief uh, twist at the end of the story, we get the, <laughs> the yeah. ultimate, ultimate blurb. And by the way, one of his ex-wives insists that this is the interpretation that Ubik is God, that she she holds that to be the case. I am Ubik. Before the universe, actually I should read it in the commercial voice. I am Ubik. <laughs> Before the universe was, I am. I made the suns, I made the worlds, I created the lives and the places they inhabit. I moved them here, I put them there. They go as I say, they do as I tell them. I am the world. I am the word, sorry, and my name is never spoken. The name which no one knows. I am called Ubik, but that's not my name. I am, I shall always be. <clears throat> if God, though, is just the combination of everybody's consciousness, I thought that was kind of hilarious because that would explain why God makes mistakes, you know? <laughs> right. It's no better than a combination of us. Uh, I think this idea of bringing someone to the present because it gets down to this there is only one moment right and that's the now and remember the thing did you watch that that clip from the uh when you asked about the the, the part of waking life where this is the the thing that philip k dick says in the in the essay where uh he kind of realizes that it's not that we're in 30 a.d or whatever it's that there is only one moment and that moment is eternity and everything is just there to kind of make you ignore the question that God is posing to you. Are you ready to become one with the with eternity? And you're saying, not right now, not right now, not right now. And that's what time is. So that's, Ubik is like bringing you into the, that moment, the, the now. That's, I guess, the, the hand of God, the spray of God. <laughs> so in this brief scene at the end, Runciter asks, for his wife to be brought in. This is picking up right from the end where we last saw him, where he says, you know what? I think I'm going to talk to Ella. Um, he tips the technician who installed her digital consciousness in the office. There's something odd about the money. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to keep you waiting, says the attendant. Uh, he starts setting up the mechanism. In short order, the task was completed. The attendant checked the circuit one last time, nodded in satisfaction, and started to leave the office. This is for you says Runciter, hands him several 50 cent pieces. I appreciate the rapidity with which you accomplish the job. Very formally spoken, but I appreciate the rapidity. <laughs> Good sir, I appreciate the rapidity with which you accomplish the job. It's a bit odd, but okay, it's fine. <laughs> what kind of money is this, he says. Runciter looks at the 50 cent pieces. He sees at once what the attendant means. Very definitely, the coins were not as they should be. Whose profile is this? Who's on all these coins? Not the right person at all. And yet, he's familiar. I know him. It was the first Joe Chip money he had ever seen. He had an intuition, chillingly, that if he searched his pockets, he would find more. This was just the beginning. So 
that's where we're left. We find that Joe's reality, sorry, Runsitter's reality <laughs> is also under the microscope at this point. We don't know how solid it is all, at all. Um, and yeah, it doesn't get resolved. I uh, should have put a big question mark after this, <laughs> the end. <laughs> um, but yeah, a lot to think about. And yes, of course, they could all just be in Half-Life and maybe they're being, maybe their proximities to each other are being changed and that's what's going on. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, we'll talk about it next time, though. Some things to consider. <clears throat> Working theories as to what could be going on. Is it all resolvable? Uh, <laughs> no. no. It wouldn't be fun to totally resolve it either, honestly. It's good for there to be a little play, you know, in there. Um, yes, so, I'm sorry, it just also reminded me of the Inception because you know how it ends also with the uh, coin and the coin is the, to the token, token, I'm, I'm pronouncing it right, token or token. Token, Token, yeah. token of, uh, That's spinning. Uh, your, of yeah. your, yeah, of your reality. So if it is spinning, uh, yeah. you are awake or I don't know if it is, uh, if it falls down, then you are not awake. So that's how the the movie ends that we are not quite sure but it looks like uh, that it is the actual reality yeah uh, i mean we have to see that movie again to to remind ourselves or to refresh there is, there is no answer on the on the end of the movie yeah yeah, I, mean, that's I, think, I think there was because the, I didn't. Because I think that Leonardo re returns to his family in the end, as far as I could understand, and, and uh, that they um, because the the coin was spinning and it didn't fall. I think that, or, or actually, I don't know. That's I thought, if I remember correctly, in the final not, scene, it blacks out. In, in the final scene, you don't see whether it falls. Isn't that true? I care. It's yeah, been a long time for me. But. In before the uh, it fall down, perhaps. Mm. Um, I thought it was left open, but something with money and with the uh, coins and tokens, definitely with the, this. Uh, yeah, I right. can't. I can't help but think that Christopher Nolan is influenced by this i mean philip k dick is hugely influential among a lot of um, i believe yes people, yeah. he influenced also christopher nolan not that just the matrix and other um, yeah 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 definitely okay so next time we will uh discuss all topics related we can theorize if you want to bring something uh you know no matter what really anything related to the story even tangentially if you like um <laughs> yeah, excuse me, but excuse me james but you mentioned uh some essay written by uh dick uh, there are lots of them actually but um you, this one i share something so with us or I, i'll send you this i'll send you the link because this particular essay i didn't read i heard about it secondhand from a scene in a movie where richard linklater talks about reading the essay <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, i can send you the link to it <laughs> I found an interesting, yeah. an interesting essay which was titled uh, "Playing Dice with the Universe." That mm -hmm. was uh, very interesting to read, and uh, I read something about, uh, um, I mean, the review which uh, was written by Stanislav Lem um, oh, yeah. about Ubik because uh, about uh, uh, Dick because uh, he really appreciated him yeah. a lot, and um, something about Isaac Asimov's mystery. Uh, mist yes he has also has detective stories uh, mm -hmm. in um in the science fiction genre yeah. but um, it was impossible to read it all i mean i found it in the e library e usa library yeah he has a bunch of uh little things that he's written also and there was a whole thing with him and i don't know if i'm misremembering this so you'll have to pardon me if i get some details wrong but do you know about uh, William Burroughs and the language as a virus from outer space concept? <laughs> that they 
they had some crossover on this. There's also the Laurie Anderson song, Language is a Virus. I don't know if you're familiar with her. Um, but Language uh, is a Virus. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, no, it's actually, it's just a little bit off-putting when, well, when you say it like that. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's a pretty interesting concept that can be related to a lot of other ideas. Uh, so, for example, if you take a sort of like, Nietzschean idea of a person who has not been so that the Nietzschean idea of like the blonde beast by the way which was sort of adopted by Nazis put that aside that's not his intention with that that was retrofitted for... blonde, blonde beast yeah so the idea is like well, oh we're I'm here... blonde I'm blonde oh my god yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay so let me let me not start with that because that's probably just adding more confusion uh, yeah. The idea is that we're too reflective, like animals, like they're not worried about, you know, whether something is right or wrong, they just kind of do their thing. But we have this reflective aspect to ourselves that causes us to do things like doubt and question and, and fear and desire and move in different directions based on these forces that are that are reflections, they come from our mind, they're psychological. <laughs> but the language is a virus concept is the thing that infected the blonde beast is the sort of like human without having been touched by all this reflection and trouble. Um, is the language a virus or the thoughts? I would rather say. Well, the, the language thoughts. is the, the the language is though. It's like the and he relates it to. I forget if it's just William Burroughs or both of them to this concept stand, it, stand from stand theology stand that the, in the beginning there was the word. That is the the reason that yeah. it's put that way it is the creation like Logos, that the word the yeah. universe is words in a sense um materialized words right okay. so it's like pseudo mystical concept but it's pretty interesting it's just that like william burroughs had a very negative view of that the idea that yes it's it, it's like an infection <laughs> um where philip k dick on the other hand was more like yes and it's good it's this vast artificial living fire, the living light from Valis. <clears throat> um, wow. It is, but Can it's good. Can you send us uh, these references <laughs> at least when we have time to read? I mean, we can. I can't promise to read all that by next Sunday, but it is a really interesting topic to think about. Yeah, I, I have to see if I can track some of that down because as far as the language is a virus stuff, I can't even remember where I read that now. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I'm going to yeah. look around for it and see if I can find something. Um, yeah. Okay, so next time we'll chat. Okay. And I hope to see Thank you guys you there. The yeah. Thanks. Yes. It's been Thank fun. you, everyone. See ya. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.